At this time, we're going to jump into the Gospel of Mark, and this message this evening is going to be more picturesque. It's going to be almost cinematic, if you will, because I think the scene lends itself to very dramatic visuals. And so that's kind of the way we're going to approach this Mark chapter 11, 1 to 6. If you have not brought a Bible and you just want to follow along on the screen, that's fine too because all the texts are going to appear on the screen. We're going to start with Mark 11, 1 through 6. Before we jump in, I just want to pray, ask God to help us to focus and to pay attention and that he might speak to us. So please pray with me quickly. Father, thank you for your word. It is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. It is our interpretive key to reality. Father, we thank you that in it we find light and life and truth. Father, you've told us through Jesus that we cannot live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from your mouth. And where we find that word proceeding from your mouth is in the word, the Bible. We thank you for the gift and opportunity to go through the Gospel of Mark verse by verse, chapter by chapter. This is really and truly a gift, and I pray that you would help us tonight as we dig into chapter 11. Give us uh, attention, help us to focus. I pray that your word would be clear and unmistakable, and that you would speak to us tonight as only you can by your Holy Spirit. Pray for all those who might be watching online right now that you would give them uh, a distraction-less environment for these next half hour, 45 minutes. Help, help us in this room and beyond and speak to us, we pray, by your Holy Spirit. May your word be clear and may your gospel be powerful to save. In Jesus' name, everyone said? Amen. We're going to start with verses 1 to 6. You can follow along on the screen here and then we'll jump into the rest of the verses as they come. Now, when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethpage and Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it and will send it back here immediately. And they went and found a colt tied at a door outside in the street. And they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? And they told them what Jesus had said. And they let them go. Now this, this text is not unfamiliar to many of you. In fact, I think some of you right now feel like it should be late winter, early spring. Because this is what we call Palm Sunday. Right? The, the next event is the, the cutting down of the palm trees, and it's the riding of the colt into Jerusalem and to the temple. However, this was a real event, and this was a fulfillment event, and this event is very, very cinematic, if you will. It's very loaded with imagery. It's loaded with fulfillment prophecy. And so that's the way we're going to look at this 14 verses of Mark 11 together. We're going to look at it in a sense climactically ending at verse 14, but we're going to look at it in scenes and stages and fulfillments. So first, Jesus has just healed blind Bartimaeus. You remember this from last week. The last thing that happened before chapter 11 began is you have blind Bartimaeus, son of David, help, save me, help me. What do you want me to do for you? Okay. And Jesus heals. And so there's this declaration, son of David, which is important for what's about to happen. And so the crowd is already stirred up because of this healing. He has already been declared to be the son of David, which has great Old Testament implications and fulfillments. And so the crowd then is coming behind Jesus and he's heading to Jerusalem. He is making his way into Jerusalem and this section to the end of the gospel takes up the last week of Jesus' life. It's very concentrated uh, focus on the last week of Jesus' life before he goes to the cross. And so they go to Bethphage and Bethany 
at the Mount of Olives. This is east of Jerusalem, uh, about two miles, Mount of Olives. It, it, it's kind of on the slope of the Mount of Olives. And, and Jesus is coming from that direction east into Jerusalem. And he says to them, to them, this is the disciples. Jesus sent two of his disciples. Now, we don't know which disciples, but my guess, my guess, is that it's probably one of the four top disciples. It's probably either Peter, James, John, or Andrew. That's my guess, because you think of the Mount of Transfiguration, you think of Peter who is behind the Gospel of Mark. So my, my guess is it's Peter. And my thoughts went immediately to what I would do if I was Peter in this situation. So he says, go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. Now, you're thinking, I don't know, man. Like, you want me to go steal someone's donkey? Like, what, what am I supposed to say here? But yet, at the same time, Jesus has been doing this kind of thing to the disciples since day one. And so I want to flash back, possibly this happened in Peter's mind, he flashed back to the very beginning when he was called and first shown who this Jesus is, which enables him possibly, or at least one of two of the disciples to trust in this moment. You remember this story in Luke 5, 1 to 11. On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing into him, on him to hear the word of God, this is the Jesus they're pressing, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, that's Peter, so he's in Peter's boat, he asked him to put out a little from the land. All right, put, put me out a little because I don't want to get crushed by the crowd. And he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Peter, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing. But at your word, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they, both boats, began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. I, I imagine as if it was Peter, or even if it wasn't, maybe it was James and John who also witnessed this event, who were partners, you know, were they thinking back like, okay, I remember that time when he said, put down your nets and there were so many fish that our boats began to sink, to sink. And so, all right, let, let's believe him. He's proven himself faithful in the past. Let's just go and do what he says. And so Jesus says, say to them if they, what, what are you doing? What are you doing? Say to them, the Lord has need of it and will send it back here immediately. And they went and found a colt tied at the door outside in the street, and they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? And they told them what Jesus had said, and they let them go. Now, two things are possible here. Okay? Jesus knew, just like in the last story, that if they put down the nets, they were going to get such a catch that it was going to cause two fishing boats to sink. And it was going to wow professional fishermen to the point where Peter exclaims, you are the Lord, and you, this display of your deity, this display of your glory is causing me to ask you to remove yourself from me. Either that's the case here where Jesus can, in his sovereignty, in his omniscience given him by the power of the Holy Spirit, he can see this colt. And he can also help the owners to release the colt by this phrase, the Lord has need of it. And roughly, uh, uh, we'll bring it back when we're done with it. Or, number two, which is also very likely, Jesus has set the situation up beforehand. 
He's already talked to the owners of the colt. He said, look, I'm going to be coming by to get this colt. I want you to put it outside, and I'm going to send people for it. Well, how will we know it's you? Well, here's, here's what they're going to say. They're going to say, the Lord has need of it, and we'll send it back here immediately. That's very possible. And so perhaps Jesus set the situation up ahead of time because he knew they were going to ask, what are you doing? You, you stealing my colt? And so the code word, if you will, was the Lord has need of it. And so when these owners of this colt heard it, they knew, okay, these are the people whom Jesus sent to get this colt, and here you go. Bo both are possible. And it really doesn't matter, but it's interesting to wonder what exactly is Jesus doing. Here's one thing that Jesus is definitely doing. He is fulfilling prophecy. He is self-consciously fulfilling all these Old Testament predictions of what the Messiah would do when he came to Jerusalem. And so we're, we're going to check that out in a minute, but first, let's move to 7 to 10, the next four verses. And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the, king, is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. So what's happening here is Jesus is doing self-fulfillment of many Old Testament prophecies. We're going to look at a scattering of them very quickly, but first let's make a couple observations before we jump into the Old Testament. So they get the colt, the colt is released, and the colt has never been ridden on before. So this is a, a, a young donkey, and it's unbroken, and it's unridden, and it is the Lord of Glory's steed, if you will. He's going to triumphantly enter his city as the king coming in glory. Yet, it's a humble coming. It's a humble coming. And so they knew, the disciples, what was going on. And so what do they do? They, they throw their cloaks, their coats, their clothes on the donkey, and they kind of make a saddle for him. So this, this donkey does not freak out. It obeys the Lord of glory. My imagination is just like he was able to control those fish and have them swim right into the net to such a degree that it sank two boats. He was also able to just put his hand on a donkey, a wild donkey that's never been ridden, non, not broken, and it fully cooperate with him. The Lord of glory speaking somehow to his creation and it lovingly obeying him. It has to be what's going on here. And so Jesus sits on this donkey, and many, so now remember, son of David, blind Barnabas, all these people are recognizing, I think, what is happening here. Maybe some of them aren't. Maybe they're caught up in the crowd, and, and they're just going along. But perhaps they do recognize what's happening. Oh my gosh, this is the son of David, and he's fulfilling Old Testament prophecy, and he's going into Jerusalem. This is it. This is the kingdom come. He's coming to overthrow the Romans and take over the, the religious system, and we're going to crown him king. This is the son of David. This is him who was promised. And so all this is probably at least in the minds of most of them. And how do you know that? Well, because of what they do. And others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna. There's a reason we sang that song uh, just before this. Hosanna, which means save us. Save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. David, they're recognizing Jesus as David's greater son, the one whom would be given a kingdom to which there would be no end. Hosanna in the highest. And so this is the way of praising. Uh, there, there was an Old, old Testament festival where, where um, branches would be waved. It was a way of honoring God. And so this is a, a declaration, a way that they would praise, a wave praise, if you will. And so they're, they're waving palm branches. They're setting, if you will, a red carpet, yet it's a green carpet. And, and he is riding his victory processional. 
And so you have people, you know, fanning, people are freaking out, people are saying, save us, they're declaring him to be David's greater son, the Savior. And so you can see the, this, this festival happening, this, this commotion. Well, I think Jesus is very self-conscious of what he's doing here. And so not only does Jesus know what's going on, but certainly some in the crowd had to know, and most definitely the religious leaders knew what was going on. So let's look at a couple places. Number one, this is where Jacob, Abraham, father of the Jewish people, has Isaac. Isaac has Jacob. Jacob's name is changed to Israel, and Jacob has 12 sons, which become the 12 tribes of Israel. One of those sons' name was Judah. Judah. And as Jacob's dying... He blesses and prophesies over his children, each of them. And here is Judah's prophecy. Look at it closely. Judah, your brother shall praise you. Hmm. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's cub. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He stooped down, he crouched as a lion, as a lioness, who dares rouse him. The scepter shall not depart from Judah. That verse 10, I'll stop there. There is something to the lion, we'll get there in a minute. But the scepter is the image of rulership and authority. And he's saying, the scepter shall not depart from you, Judah. You are going to continuously rule, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until tribute comes to him. And to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. Binding his foal to the vine and his donkey's colt, dramatic pause, to the choice vine, he has washed his garments in the wine and his vesture in the blood of grapes. His eyes are darker than wine, his teeth whiter than milk. Now, there is a lot to unpack there, and I do not have the time to do it. Okay, there's a lot going on there. There's, there's near fulfillment of prophecy in Judah and in his, in his children, but then there's great pro- prophetic fulfillment in Jesus himself. And the two places, or the three, is one, the lion, which we'll look at in just a minute, two, the scepter not departing, the ruler's staff from between his feet, and then three, this donkey's colt being tied to the vine. So way back in Genesis, this cult imagery, this ruler imagery, this lion imagery is prophesied to Judah who is going to have children, who are going to have children, who are going to have children, who is going to birth David. Jesse to David. And then David to Solomon and so on we get to Jesus. You can read the genealogy in Luke if you'd like. All right, here's, here's another one. Zechariah 9, 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, daughter of Jerusalem. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Now get this, this is so specific. And you might think, all right, Jesus is just engineering this. You know, he, he knows the Old Testament well. He understands the prophecy of Judah from Jacob to Judah. He's read Zechariah 9, 9, and he's just orchestrating this whole thing. Really? So, behold, your king is coming to you, Jerusalem. And the, the cry, or I should say the prophecy, is to cry aloud. And what's going on? Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We, we see this exact prophecy fulfilling here in Mark 11. Behold, your king is coming to you. He's righteous and he has salvation. Hosanna means save us, salvation. And look at the humility of this king. Humble, mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Now, Jesus is the Lord of glory. Now, you have to understand that me, myself, as a pastor, as a minister of the gospel, as one who takes the Bible and seeks to explain it and flush it out and apply it, I am working from a presupposition, okay? A presupposition is something that you believe, it's presupposed, and then other things are built upon it. My presupposition is that the Word of God is true 
and accurate and helpful and good and sharper than a two-edged sword, able to divide soul and spirit, bone and marrow, judging the thoughts and intents of the heart. That's my presupposition. I believe that the Bible is the Word of God, and in every book, all 66, it speaks truth and life and light, and through it we interpret everything else. And through it, the gospel at the center, Jesus Christ. Even back here in Genesis and now in Zechariah 9.9, we see this Jesus, this King come. Way back in Genesis 3, where the snake crusher is going to take a heel strike, but yet crush the serpent's head. The whole Bible is about Jesus. And so I'm assuming, friends, you're, you're, you're getting it from me as if this is true, because I really believe this is true. This is the way it is. And so some of you might not share my presupposition. However, what I want you to know, even if you don't believe that the Bible is true and all of its books and helpful and, and gives us light in life and an interpretive grid for the, the whole of reality, here's what I want you to know. You cannot deny that the Bible is tight in its prophecy, in its hyperlinkage, if you will. You know, the Bible is a book that links to so many places. Some of you come here and you, your mind is just blown because you're like, why does he go to so many Bible verses? Why can't he just stay in Mark? Well, the reason is because it's one hyperlinked book where we could jump from book to book and it's all connected. And if I'm interpreting it correctly, then this whole book is revealing one big story to us. And it's that there is a king and that he is the Lord of glory, yet he comes in such a way where we can relate to him. He comes in such a way that if he were to show up in all of his glory, we would perish. Moses, take off your sandals, for the ground where you are standing is holy ground. What made it holy? The Lord of glory was present, and it made the ground holy and separate. What made the holy of holies? A terrifying place even for the high priest once a year to go into on the Day of Atonement. Because if that priest's sins were not atoned for and he went in there guilty without atonement, the glory and presence of the Lord would just diminish his molecules and he would be taken apart by the glory of the Lord. And so in order for us to have a faithful high priest who is tempted in all ways as we are, yet without sin, in order for God to relate to us who are dust, from dust you are taken to dust you shall return, for us to relate to God, he had to become dust, friends. You realize that the Lord of glory who spoke and all things came into existence took the dirt, the dust, formed man, breathed life into man, and then said, one day, me too. I shall become this dust that life needs breathed into. And so he comes. And not only does he come in great humility, he comes for the lowest of the low. And even when he comes declaring his kingship, he comes in a humble manner. He comes in a humble manner. Now, this is good news for us, friends, because for many of us, we are of low estate. We, many of us do not have degrees. Many of us are not high in class economics. Many of us don't have power positions in society. Many of us are just citizens, in a sense, trying to survive, trying to honor the Lord with our lives. And yet, here's the Lord of glory becoming one of us. One of us. In humble identification. And even in his declaring to be the king, he comes humbly, relatably, that you could reach out and touch him and not perish. You could hug him and survive. <laughs> I love it. He became one of us. And he, came, he became one of us, not just so that we could relate to him, but that he might fulfill our failures, that he might succeed where we fail, that he might not sin and give in to temptation, where we always sin and give in to temptation. And here is one of those, if you will, hyperlinks to Mark 11. It's that rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Well, they're doing it. Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. 
Behold, your king is coming to you righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And those who went before him and those who followed him were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. And now, I want to look at this last verse here before we move on to our closing verses. This verse 10. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. Let's look at 2 Samuel 7, 12 to 17. This is uh, Nathan the prophet. You see that in verse 17 at the very end? Uh, Nathan spoke to David. The last four words of this section here. So Nathan, the prophet, is speaking to David, the king, and he prophesies and he promises him something. So let's look at it. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, that's a way of saying you die and are buried with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. Now, this is a twofold prophecy here. We'll see where there's immediate fulfillment in Solomon, and then we'll look at where there's future fulfillment in Jesus. I will establish his kingdom. Verse 13, Solomon, he shall build a house for my name. Solomon is the architect and builder of the temple. I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. That is not Solomon, because we have record of his dying. So that has to point beyond Solomon to a greater son of David. Verse 14, I will be a father, or or to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, all right, we know that's not Jesus, because Jesus never committed iniquity. In the last prophecy, we saw that he was righteous, but we know that Solomon committed many iniquities. (laughs) We have Ecclesiastes, right? You just read that book, and you're like, oh my gosh, this dude was a wreck. 700 concubines and 300 wives? I mean, that alone says it. This dude was a mess. Who's laughing? It's true. He's a mess. Okay. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the son of men. But my steadfast love will not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you. And your house, look at this verse 16, and your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever, forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever in accordance with all these words and in accordance with all this vision Nathan spoke to David. And so what we have here is Nathan the prophet prophesying to David that, look, I'm going to establish your throne forever. Remember the prophecy to Judah? The scepter shall not pass, and the rulership shall not pass from between your feet. This is it being fulfilled in time. Now, let's look at Revelation, the last book of the Bible, and we can see Jesus here as this definite fulfillment of this prophecy to Judah. Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back. So it's, it's written on the inside of the scroll. Flip the scroll around. It's written on the back too. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll and look into it. And I began to weep. That I is John, the apostle who wrote the book of Revelation, exiled on Patmos. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, weep no more. Behold, the lion from the tribe of Judah, the root of David. There you see both fulfillments. Lion from the tribe of Judah, rulership through David. The root of David has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. Here's the image. God the Father, the one who holds all reality, is holding a scroll of judgment in his hand. And who is powerful enough, who is worthy enough to open and unleash judgment on the earth? No one is found except the lion from the tribe of Judah, 
Jesus Christ. And so here, because of what Jesus accomplished here, we're seeing it play out in Mark 11. Because of his coming into Jerusalem, humbling himself, becoming a man, humbling himself even to death, death on a cross, and being raised up to the highest name that is above every name, he is now able to unleash God's judgment on the earth here in this book of Revelation. He is the lion from the tribe of Judah. He's the fulfillment of the prophecy from Jacob to Judah. He's the fulfillment of 2 Samuel where Nathan says to David, your throne will be established forever. And we see it dramatically playing out in Mark chapter 11. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Save us, Hosanna in the highest. And so you can see what's happening here. Surely some of those in the crowd understood those prophecies I just read to you. Surely some of them understood what was going on here. And Jesus is self-consciously fulfilling these prophecies. Let's move on. Psalm 118, 25 to 26. This is what these, the crowd here is quoting. They're shouting out a form of Psalm 118, 25 to 26. Look at it. Save us, we pray. O Lord, O Lord, we pray. Give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. So even what they say is not without scriptural reference. The crowd here is praising the coming king in fulfillment of prophecy, and they're singing a form of Psalm 118, 25, and 26. Save us, which is what Hosanna means. Save us, we pray. O Lord, O Lord, we pray. Give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. Verse 11, and he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Now, this is, this is strange, I admit. So he's got this triumphal entry, fulfillment of prophecy, crowds are freaking out, palm branches are being ra raised, psalms are being quoted, you know, even the children are crying out, and, and the scene is so, if you will, anticlimactic. He just comes into the temple. He looks around, it's late, and he leaves. This is strange. But what we need to know here is he is observing the worship that is happening at the temple. Okay? Now, we don't have this in the text. Mark is a very condensed version of what happens. But what we know is the religious establishment of the day turned the outer courts of the temple into, if you will, a marketplace. It was the court of the Gentiles. It was where the non-Jewish people could come and meet with God. And so Jesus makes his way into this area where the Gentiles were allowed to come, and then beyond that you could have the court of the women, and then beyond that the men could go, and then beyond that only the priests could go, and then beyond that only the, the high priest could go. And so there was access and levels, uh, you know, in presence sense to God. And so in this most outer level where the nations were supposed to be able to meet with God, Jesus shows up as the king, and he looks around, and he sees what is more like a market than a place to meet with God and to find Him and to communicate with Him and to worship Him. And he is, he is disgusted and enraged. Now, we don't get this in the text, but the next scene in the story shows us that he is enraged and he is upset. And I'm going to turn there now, and then we're going to finish up. On the following day, so, so it's the next day, when they came from Bethany, about a two-mile journey here, he was hungry. So Jesus wants something to eat. And seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. 
and his disciples heard it. What's going on here? That's weird. <laughs> What's going on here is this is a parable or a picture of the temple and, if you will, contemporary Judaism and its way of worship. The fig tree has leaves on it, so it looks like it should be producing fruit. But Jesus goes up to it to get some fruit, and there's no fruit. And so what does he do? He curses the fig tree. And next week's message, you're going to have to come back to see him cursing the temple and freaking out and declaring its demise. But this is a picture of the first century religious environment that Jesus was birthed into, and listen to this, came to fulfill. And so he curses the fig tree, and, and spoiler alert, next week, the fig tree withers up and dies. And that's all I'll say about it. I'll save, I'll save that for next week. But his coming to the temple just before this incident and looking around, it's as if he's seeing a fruitless, non-worshipping, producing, in a sense, barring people from finding the true God, religious Judaism. And the king has come to make the way for true worship and true relationship with him. And so by doing this with the fig tree, he's in a sense doing it with the temple and with the religious system of his day. He is condemning it as false and barring people from coming to know God. And you'll see that play out dramatically next week. Now, here's, here's where I want to, to see this fulfilled here and close the message part. Do we, as 21st century worshipers, do something similar? Do we bar people from access to the true and living God? And you say, how could we possibly do that? Well, the scripture says that people will know us by our fruits. You will know them by your fruits, Jesus says. Now, surely... Our fruit, remember the fig tree not producing fruit, our fruit looks many multifaceted. That's a weird way of saying that, but here's what I mean. The fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5 is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. When God comes to live inside of you, when he brings you into his kingdom, you are escaping the kingdom of darkness. You are entering the kingdom of light and light and his son. You are changed and transformed in a spiritually real way. Yet outwardly and physically, you are much the same. But inwardly, you are changed and transformed to such a degree that as you grow and as the Holy Spirit takes over, you begin to look different, you begin to think different, you begin to act different, your motivations change. What's one, what once brought you joy now brings you grief, and what maybe once brought you grief, walking in the way of the Lord, now brings you joy. Things begin to change gradually. Here's my question, where are you at? Where's your fruit? Now, there's an irony in the question, because the fruit is not actually something you can produce. And so, if we are to look at ourselves and look for fruit, as Jesus is looking at the fig tree, looking at the system of first century Judaism, looking for fruit, we know that it's the fruit of the Holy Spirit, not the fruit of Tim and Eddie and Eric and so on and so forth. The bad news is, friends, you can't produce the fruit of the Holy Spirit. The good news is, you don't have to produce the fruit of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will produce this fruit in you. But the question is, are you doing what you are commanded to do, which is walk by the Spirit and not by the flesh? Are you walking in daily communication with God? Are you seeking His kingdom and His righteousness, expecting all these things to be added to you? Or is it the reverse? You're seeking all these things to be added to you, and then maybe after that, I'll seek the kingdom a little bit. 
Are you asking the Holy Spirit to work inside of you and work through you and change you? Or are you like, no, I actually like where I'm at. There's a couple sins that I'm just enjoying. I don't want to put away. If, if you're not actively living in God's presence, asking him to kill your sin. Listen, I didn't say you do the work and kill your sin. I said asking him to kill your sin. You are not going to produce fruit. If you never get into the Bible in a meaningful way, if you're more like a snacker, how many of you are snackers? Like, you don't really eat big meals, but just all through the day, man, it's like a carrot here and a little bag of chips here and maybe a cookie here and a, yeah, Theo's like, yeah, I'm a snacker. Thank you for admitting that. My prayer is that you are not Bible snackers. Right, you're just like a, a verse of the day here and a Christian song there and maybe at night a chapter here. My, my prayer is that you're not just Christianity light, my friends. This should be whole life Christianity. Jesus demands our all. You remember, take up your cross and follow me. Go sell everything you have and then come and follow me. Jesus makes these radical demands on our lives and yet we live as if he's just a little portion, maybe a sixteenth of our lives and then we wonder why this isn't real to us. Why is, why is there no fruit in my life? Friends, are you seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and, and then all these things being added to you? Or are you seeking everything else with just a little bit of snack on the side? Listen, to, to change the expression a little bit, man cannot live on snacks alone. <laughs> like, if you're like Christianity light, and you're wondering, why is there no fruit in my life? Why am, I, and I, why am I not experiencing God and His power in my life? Why am I not changing? The question is, are you engaging with Him? Are you practicing the means of grace that He's given you? Not the means of saving grace, but the means of sustaining grace, sanctifying grace. Are you eating? Listen, one sermon a week is not enough. It's not enough. So friends, here's my plea. We, we do this Christianity thing. And my plea is make it more to you than it is now. And here's the second kind of fruit. So we're looking for the fruit of the Spirit. We're looking for the love, the joy, the peace, the patience, the kindness, the gentleness, the faithfulness, and the self-control. We're looking for that fruit, and we're looking for the Holy Spirit to produce that fruit. But the second kind of fruit is that people look at you, and they look at your life, and they're like, they are different. It could be said of you in the language of Peter that there's some kind of stranger and alien in this world. They're different than everybody else. They see the love that you have for others and your fellow believers, and they're like, they must be Jesus' disciples. This kind of fruit that you, you shine like a city on a hill. You are a light to the world. You are a witness to His transforming glory and grace and glorious gospel. You are a witness, not just with your words, but friends, with your life. You are a changed and transformed son or daughter of God, and the fruit is ripe and right there. And God can use you to expand His kingdom. Friends, what does it profit a man, a woman, to gain the whole world and lose your soul? The most important, valuable thing that you have is your eternal soul, your eternal spirit. All of your accumulations, all of your accomplishments, all of your accolades will pass into the wind, into the fire as if nothing. And yet, what are you investing in, friends? Are you looking for outward fruit from your life that will simply burn up in the judgment? I pray not. I pray that you are living your life in such a way that whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, look for that fruit. This is unto you. This is for Christ's sake. This is for His glory. This is for His kingdom. And listen, I'm in the struggle with you. 
The bills come every month to my house too. My kids are extra disobedient. And I have to discipline them and me repent after disciplining them because I'm angry. Anyone with me? No parents with me. Yeah. You, you got to constantly, this thing's hard, man. And so we're in this already, we're in the kingdom, we're changed and transformed, we're headed to glory, and there's little bits of fruit, but we want more, don't we? We want more of God. We want more of His fruit in our lives. We want His glory to break out of us, less of us, more of Him. And my prayer is that we would see more of Jesus in you and that you would see more of Jesus in me so that we would produce the fruit of the Holy Spirit. We would love our neighbor as ourself. We would love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then we would be such light in this darkness that we would be able to spread the good news which is able to save. We can do good as we have opportunity. Yes, to those who are of the household of faith, but also to those who aren't. And share the glory and goodness of God. To come alongside a neighbor who's hurting and bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. And I could go on and on and on, couldn't I? But my plea with you is don't let it be said of you if you were the fig tree and Jesus walks up to you and he's like, oh look, there's leaves. There's an appearance of godliness and an activity of the Spirit and then he comes to you and there's nothing. Now, I'm stretching the metaphor. That's, that's not what the verse is talking about. It's talking about Jerusalem and its fruitlessness. But let's, let's do some inventory here. How are we doing? And tonight might be an opportunity for you to repent. And listen, repentance is a gift from God. Repentance is one of the best things that you can do, and it's one of the most healthy and beautiful things you can do. Don't think about it in a condemnation sense. Think about it in a sense of you're turning from poison and you're being given nourishment and life. You're turning from what will cause death to what will inevitably bring you life. You're turning from hell and its lures and its enticements to glory and godliness it's beautiful it's a gift and so we have opportunity again the gift is available again for us to turn from our sinful ways maybe maybe it's simply turning from our apathy if we're honest tonight it's just like god i don't care it's just, there's nothing really in me that is attracted to you, to your Bible, to your way of living, to your people. In fact, I'm, I'm not even sure why I'm here. Friends, turn. Turn from that apathy. Turn from that coldness of soul and ask God to warm you with affection for Him and for the things of God. And so we're going to take communion. And it's going to be an opportunity for you to do some, do some time with God. Yes, we're going to sing. But maybe, maybe for you, it's not time to sing. Maybe it's time to meet with God for real. And the offer of forgiveness and salvation is always on the table, friends. This is our God. He is full of grace and full of truth. And so though He will speak truth to us, He always has grace extended to us. He always has open arms. If you come to Him, He will not cross His arms or stiff arm you. Rather, He will come to you with arms open. And if the parable of the prodigal son is true, as soon as you start to take steps towards Him, He comes running to you. This is our God. And so turn towards Him. Move towards Him, and He will come to you. And so we're, we're going to take communion right now, uh, but before we do, we are going to sing a song. We're going to sing, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Tune my heart to sing your praise. This song, and, and Matt will elaborate it on a bit too, but, but this song is one that says, you are the source of all good things. You are the fountain of every blessing. Let me drink from that fountain. Let me find you near and blessed. Come thou fount of every blessing. 
We're, we're saying to God, come near to me and help me to drink in of your grace. Do your mighty work on me. One line that I love, Matt, uh, I'm sure you love it too, is may your goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee. A fetter is kind of like a shackle. It's kind of like handcuffs. And so we're saying, let, my, let the goodness of God shackle me to you. Tune my heart, just like you tune a guitar or, or tune the strings of a piano. Tune my heart to sing your praise. And so we're going to take communion as one church after we sing. So if you could stand, we are going to sing. Maybe you're not going to sing. Maybe you're going to do business with God right where you're standing. And then after we sing, I will come back up and I will lead us all as we remember the Lord's death until he comes, as we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Thank you.